about greater works. Remember, Jesus said greater works will you do in that. Um, but uh, I really want to make sure that we understand that everything that's going on with us and everything that God is trying to develop us into is about and having to do more with our spiritual life than it has to do with our natural lives. Okay, so let's make sure we keep that. You've heard me say this before. Everything happens in the spirit realm first. It happens in the spirit realm. By the time we get it and see it, even reports on the news and terrible atrocities and absurdities, all those things, still something happened in the spirit realm before that took place. Something happened in the spirit to those people who are associated with them before it actually manifested himself. And so tonight, as we, we go into this proverb, chapter 24, that's kind of what I want to point out. Something and everything God is trying to do with us concerning greater works is always going to be associated with first for our spiritual life, not so much always for our natural condition. Our, though my outward man perish, my inward man is being renewed daily, being renewed daily. And, and I got to continue to keep that area uh, sharp and spiritual and in fine tune um, if, if nothing else will work. But look at Job before we're going to come back to Proverbs 24, but look at Job 42, 5, and 6. I want someone to read that for me while we stay at Proverbs 24. 30. Amen. Job 42 verses 5 and 6. Watch, watch, watch what Job is saying right here. And this is connected to the point of everything is for our spirit life more than it is for our natural life because it has to do with, you know, our spiritual eternal rest and how it's going to be there later and how it's going to be there. And though when we're raised and when we're coming up in life, our world, our age just tries to get us to constantly focus on the natural life and what's, you know, what we have and don't have and all these other things. But that's not where it's really at. We have Job 42, verse 5 and 6 for me, please. Right. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I appear myself and repent in the dust and ashes. Mm. Job says, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Or now there's something, something, you know, I'm in tune now with the spirit more. I'm in tune now with the spirit of, of all things and everything and what's really going on in this life. What's really going on in our world. And it's not just politics and it's not just who's going to be the president. And not going to be it. And all that stuff is so small. It's pathetic when you, when we really understand kind of what's really going on. And, and Job is given a, a glimpse of that there when he, my eyes have, my ears have heard of you. Now my eyes have seen you or he's, he, 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 we know he's not talking about physically really seeing him. He's talking about now I'm awake, if you will. My spirit is awake to what everything is really all about. It's about the spirit and the spirit of things. And even my my outer life is still very much connected to my invisible life or to the invisible realm of things. He says, therefore, I despise myself and I repent in ashes. He's coming to 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 himself to really say what he really knows what what God really wants and, and, and what God really, really wants is read this act 1730. Let's read that because remember the apostle Paul was speaking to all the Greek philosophers. This was in Greece where all the philosophers there, the great thinkers. And this is where, you know, at one time, you know, Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and, and all these guys, they were there and they, you know, they, they had created or come up with, you know, what they call, um, you know, uh, argumentation and rhetoric and all these things. And the Apostle Paul walks past this place where they are on Mars Hill and look at what the Apostle Paul said to them in relation to what I'm speaking about. What did he say? If someone could read it for me, please, that would be great. Acts 1730. Yes. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, at the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now, let's back up a little more. Let's go to 28, 29. Give us some context of what yeah. he was saying, please, when he started talking to them. 
Okay. Um, I'll start at then. Uh, let's see. Can I go back to 24? Please, please, okay. please. Uh, God teacher, that teach us, teacher. <laughs> God that made the world and uh -oh. all things therein. God that made the world. Hold on, I got to jump in. Uh -huh. Please. Is it okay if I can preach with you? Please, go ahead. All right. Take, take now, it over, Pastor. Now, notice what he's saying. Now, he's there with the smartest people in the world. You got to understand what's going on right there right now, right? This mm -hmm. was the this was the educational epic yeah. center. This was Silicon Valley of the world. You realize this, right? Yeah. This is what was going yeah. on right here. Paul was there with the Silicon Valley of the world. And here he was now talking with these smart, smart people. And he walked by and he saw them there and they were there doing what they normally do. And all these great, smart, wise people came out of there and they changed our world in terms of intellect and philosophy and psychology and all this stuff. But the Lord made it so that we can see Paul come through that place where all these intellectual people were. Cool. You know, a lot of times you could be too smart for your own good. Well, that's exactly what was going on. They were smart on the outside, but they didn't really know what was life in the world really about. So Paul was being chosen to give it to him. Read it for me again. Okay, please. I'm going to go up to, I'm going to start at verse 21. Since you brought, since you brought, brought that I up. Like for all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mark heel and said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life uh -oh. and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the earth, all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and Woo. the bounds of their habitation. My God, is it, are you hearing all this stuff? Amen. Look how many questions about life he just answered. Yes. To the smartest people in the world. Hallelujah. He just told the smartest people in the world at that time. Look, you don't know this God. We didn't come from some primordial ooze. We didn't come out of uh because the stars collided together and there was a big bang. And I, <laughs> he was like, I know y'all can sit up here and look at these stars and y'all can go over and say all this. He's like, but I'm talking to you about what life is really about since y'all meet here regularly and y'all talk about what y'all think. Remember, they were they were thinkers and the philosophers. And remember the difference between philosophy and theology. And I taught on this before. Philosophy doesn't mean it happens to have truth in it. It just can sound wise and sound important. Mm -hmm. and this is why people can win an argument with rhetoric, though it may not have any truth to it. They just know the art of, of speech and the art of ethos and pathos and logos. They know how to get in there and move around and make your argument look false, though theirs is really false. That's called rhetoric. That's, and so here Paul was, he had to jump in there and say, let me tell you what life is really about. Keep going. Amen. Uh, verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Uh-oh. In him we what? We live and move and have our being. In him we live and move and have our being. It ain't in the clothes we wear. It's not in the houses we live in. It's not in what we're driving and where we work. No, it's in him we live and operate and we move and we have our existence. It's in him that through him, these greater works are going to come out of our lives. And, and we're going to be able to, like that spiritual man I mentioned to you before we started recording, he was a spiritual man. He was a wise 
Vince man, and and he decided to to get all these poor children in India some drinking water, and they look at it, and all of a sudden now the whole world wants to follow him, and they called him a great man, and he was like, how am I a great man? I thought I was just showing mercy. He was, <laughs> and, and I, I I can't stop thinking about that because he was right. He was like, don't call me a, a, a phenomenal person because I saw a charitable need that needed to be done. Mm-hmm. Because he saw something in the invisible when everyone else was looking through it naturally. They saw that these kids have been drinking out this river, getting sick for 30 years. <laughs> and he decided because he believed that he was, you know, getting this in the spirit. Um, I don't even know what his religion was. I know he's not Christian. But my point is how much more so for us as Christians that when we see this type of thing, when we see something that's greater works, go ahead and do it. That's that greater works that Jesus was talking about. And, and this is why we can't stop going to these countries and going to, you know, these different continents and, and, and opening up things and putting things in motions and, and, and getting all these kids school books and education. I, I was recently talking to my father about it recently and he knows that he speaks at all these libraries and everything. And he's talking about the Indian culture mixed with the black culture and stuff like that. And, and because that's who our, my descendants were, a Seminole Indian. And then, and then, and every time when I say, okay, with that, I'm, I'm really happy that you're still doing that and you're going to give him speeches. He said, son, that's compared to what you and your wife were doing. He said, you are saving humanity. He's like, you are reaching for the poor and the orphans and the homeless and the widows and you are reaching for people that people just walk by and do nothing. Even the people in their own countries. You know, when we see them, when we're in these countries and places, even the people who really got it, they still just look at them like there's nothing. Going back to what Paul was saying, and he was telling these men at Mars Hill, he was like, I see y'all here, and you're having these great intellectual conversations and debates. And he's like, but it's, it's, it's going nowhere. He said, it means nothing because nothing happens. So let's finish where you are, Sister Brittany. Amen. Um, for in Read him that we last live. Sentence. Read that last sentence back over. For in him we live and move, your own poets Woo. have said. For we. Uh oh, wait. Did you hear what he just said? He said, oh, and by the way, you know those poets that y'all like and worship? Socrates, Aristotle, and, and, and Hermes, and all these different folks that y'all like, you Virgil, and all these guys. He was like, by the way, he said, even of your poets that you like, they said what? Mm-hmm. For in him we live and move and have our being. They couldn't identify who he was. They didn't really know he was Jesus, but they knew he, he was there and he existed. Mm-hmm. And they didn't know how to articulate it. So God set it up. That it was going to be Paul's job mm. to introduce him to them. Let's go. Um, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We know we come from him. We just, anybody ever explained to us though how to get to him. So we're going to just sit here and try and connect to him through our minds. Mm-hmm. Are you seeing what's going mm-hmm. on there? Today, we find people like, like that to this day. They, they even want to have a spiritual experience, but they don't know you need a disciple. A disciple of Jesus will help you have that experience. Because that's exactly what Paul is doing. He's helping them cross over into this invisible realm by saying something. Watch. Verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Ooh, ooh, ooh. This is a lot right there. Mm -hmm. As notice how you're talking about the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. It's like you shouldn't even make a picture of it. We know the second commandment tells us that. And that's why you didn't see no pictures of no Jesus around here and all that type stuff. And 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 he was breaking that down. He was like, Y'all keep trying to figure out, does God look like this? Does God look like this? Does God look like this? This is what Paul was saying. He was like, Y'all caught up in your thinking. Keep going. And the times of this ignorance, God winked. Or at the times of this ignorance, God winked at. You see that? That's very powerful, Mm -hmm. huh? Because he was saying, 
you're ignorant of spiritual things. And he was like, and there was a time when God was like, you know, I'm a wink at that because they're ignorant of spiritual things. They got to have somebody to help lead them or teach them or, or the word of God or the Holy Ghost, the spirit of God, something got to show them. But now he's saying, but now what God is doing to get people but, to cross over to the spirit thing, here's what he's telling them. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Who, who's commanding who to repent? God. God is commanding yeah. all. Did it say all men? All men. All everywhere. Men. Where? Everywhere. Everywhere. It ain't no just believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. <laughs> that, that that ain't repenting. <laughs> he right. said he is calling all men everywhere to repent. This is a very, very, very powerful statement. Keep going. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, we know he's talking about Jesus, right? And so here Paul is now telling the smartest people in the world, the professors, the scholars, the doctrinal professors, all these guys. He was like, look, I know y'all smart and everything, but you'll never be able to see into the invisible that way. You'll never be able to see in him you live, in him you move, in him you have your existence that way. That is the way of ignorance. And he was like, and God ain't winking at, winking at that anymore. And he was saying, but God did make a way by this Jesus who had to go die for all of us. And if you want to get to these greater works that God really wants y'all to do, all men in the entire world must. What? And Let's see who else spoke the same language. Oh, is there anything else for us? Uh, there's a few right more here? scriptures. All right, come on. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit, certain men clave unto him and believed. Uh -oh. among what happened? They, some, howbeit, certain men clave unto him and believed. Some of them smart philosophers and professors and those, those rhetoricians and all them smart people, they believe. They were like, you know what? Don't let this guy walk away without connecting to him because I believe he just gave us the answer to our entire lives of all of humanity that all humanity must repent. Man. Keep going a little bit. Um, the last uh, says, uh, among the which was Dionys, the arrow, the arrow pie guy. I don't know how to pronounce that one. And a woman named Demarius and uh -huh. others with them. Amen. Them, was the, them folks was wise, weren't they? They were ready yeah. to go. They were like, uh-uh. I didn't hear something that my spirit is, is being, I can see something now. I can, I heard something, but I can hear differently now. Something ministered to them. And when he said, all men everywhere must repent. They've been on that hill talking about medicine and stars and doctors and arguments and lawsuits. They've been up there for years and years and years. So somebody came there and said, look, all you smart people, that's ignorance. If you really want to get smart, repent. Amen. And some start to follow him. Let's go to Luke 24, 46 and 47. So we know Paul gave this message of repentance. And Lord Jesus, I hope we come back to this Proverbs 24, verse 30. I hope we could ever get to it. But the Holy Ghost just told me we're going to close with it. Read it for me, please. Luke 24, 46 and 47. Now we heard Paul just tell the whole world, right? Paul just gave that to the whole world. Because those were the smartest people in the world. <laughs> no one else was smarter than those in Athens. And that's why they were there throwing all their smarts at each other. Because if you ever wanted to know what was the next great thing, you had to go to that place right there, Athens, Greece. If you want to know when AI was going to come out or something new, I'm just using that language. You had to go there or it. if it came around the world, it came from Athens, Greece. Thank God that the Lord sent Paul in there, huh? Let's go. Read it for me. 24, verse 46 and 47. Amen. Um, go ahead. And it said unto them, 
Okay. Thus it is written, and thus it behold Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, oh. and that repentance and remission of sins Baptism. should be preached in his name among all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. Oh. Preach in his name, baptize him in his name, let that be done where? Beginning at Jerusalem. Beginning at Jerusalem. And go on all the way to 47. That's 47. All right. Here's verse 48. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Wow. That was verse 48. Luke 24, 46 through 48. Again, speaking to 49. Everybody. Everybody must pass through this route. Go to Matthew 4, 17. And we get ready to wrap it up right here. And this was just, I wanted to talk to you about what is supposed to happen in order for us to be able to see now that it's all about our spiritual life, not the outer life. And so that's the area where we got to fine tune. That's the area that we got to work on. That's the area that we got to make adjustments. We, the Bible says from that time on, Jesus began to preach. What? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew 4, 17. And at the close of his ministry, he indicated that repentance was to be the paramount topic. Repentance is the keys. That's remember Peter on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. It's the paramount topic. And this is what I used in Africa. And I had all these uh, uh, door hangers and I had all these tracks. And, and I got a renewed sense, church, for using these tracks. Go ahead, Fitz, Sister Stephanie, finish reading it. Or Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mm. So we know from that time, everything, it seemed like, you notice, there's, it's th that that repentance is there. It keeps throwing that repentance there because without it, your eyes are still in ignorance. Without it, you're in ignorance. And this is what Paul was trying to teach the smart people, but they didn't really get it. But a handful of them did get it. And they was like, oh, we kept thinking we could think our way through this thing. And he's like, no, the only way you're going to do it is you got to repent your way through or you won't be able to see like Job when he saw in Job 42, 5 and 6. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And as soon as his eyes have seen him and he understood because his eyes didn't physically see him, he was just saying, I'm, I'm woke now. How? He said, therefore, I shall despise myself and repent so I can get a better vision of what this whole life is about. And every man I know and every woman I know and every person I know, if they think that they're going to be able to make it without repentance, I'm going to have to just tell them the truth. You ain't gonna be able to make it without repentance, sister. <laughs> Not according to Matthew 4 17. You ain't gonna be able to make it without repentance, brother. Not according to Job 42, 5 and 6. I, I know you sing in the choir and I know you do some other stuff and I know you do all this, but you ain't gonna be able to make it without repentance. Exodus 32, 14. It, it, it tells us the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. And then another, that was Genesis 6 and 6. But then another example was, is that having considered wiping out the people of Israel of their sinfulness in the worship of the golden calf, God changed his mind. And then the Lord re relented and did not bring the people to a disaster that was threatening them. And it goes into because they repented. This is what I was preaching when I was in Africa. I was preaching it all the time because I had all these flyers. And and it, and it almost sounds elementary, but it's not elementary. It's, it, I, I think what happens is we keep thinking that we're going to still be able. We've done that already. And then and it's over. No, no, it ain't over. You're going to have to still repent again. If you want to see more, you want to come out of more ignorance, repent more. Repent again. 
stay in repentance. I always hear my wife said before, stay close to repentance, close to forgiveness, and close to uh and and stay in love. Remember Second Chronicles 7 14, if my people were called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and repent, then will the heavens be open and I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. My God, is still something very powerful about that repentance. And let's go to finally the closing scripture that I have for you tonight. And we're going to do this in eight minutes. Proverbs 24, 30. Amen. And when I left Uganda, I left with this scripture as they we stood before them. And I gave them one final word before we drove up to the airport. And this was this scripture right here. I went by the field of a slothful, lazy person. Really somebody that won't repent. They won't go into the next level of, of uh, coming out of ignorance and coming out of the fog and the cloud. And, and it says in Proverbs 24, 30, I went by the field of a slothful, of the lazy, and by the vineyard of a man void of understanding. And lo, verse 31, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. I'm speaking in the Holy Ghost. Verse 32, then I saw and I considered it well. I looked upon it and I received instruction, a little sleep. A little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as that of a travailed and that want as an armed man. What? What happened? How did the person wind up in travail and in poverty and being robbed of things and and how did they wind up sleep and ignorance and and folding hands and and they they didn't really understand what god had given them and it tells us in verse 30 since i went by the field of a slothful or a lazy person and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. Now, I talked to him to church, but, but we really got to get this because he wants us to clean up our field and our vineyard. Our field is something that was handed to us. It was given to us by our leaders, our parents, our teachers, our ministers, our pastors, and the, the, the spiritual people in our life. They've given us a field. Just like in the Bible, and the Bible said there was a man and he had a field and, and he found a, uh, something uh, valuable on the field. And it said that he, he thought it was so important that he went back and bought the whole field. And then we know Jesus even taught on the fields before and, and a sower went out to sow and, and, and the sower sowed on this ground and that ground. And, and when it's talking about, I went by the field, this is the inheritance. This is what we have gotten in the spirit. God has given us something. He's given me something for my pastor. He's given you something from your pastor. He's given all of us something in the spirit. This field is something in the invisible. And so that we are to be lazy anymore. Lazy and learn any more about it. Lazy in the spirit. Lazy in scripture. Lazy in any area. That's why it says of the slothful. When he talked about those at Mars Hill, called them ignorant. They, they were lazy of spiritual things. But of this field that we have been given is we're actually very rich with this field. Because in that day, even if you were left a small field, you were able to become very wealthy off of that small field. Is everyone hearing me tonight? Even if your family left you a very small piece of land. You were able to become very wealthy off of that land. You didn't need a hundred acres. All you needed was a field. And with that field, the Holy Ghost was going to show you how to prosper in that field. Listen, I went by the field of a slothful and by the vineyard. Now, this vineyard was in powerful because for some reason he goes from a field to a vineyard. Because not all of the field was a vineyard because some of the field was going to be used for a vineyard. But there's other parts of your field that's going to be used for something else. What field are you in? As a matter of fact, 
I think that's what we got to ask ourselves. What, what is your field? Can you go higher in it? Go further in it? What, what field has been transferred to you from the pastors, from your leaders, from your teachers? I'm not talking about from the word of God. I'm talking about that and from the Holy Ghost. But I'm not just talking about from fly by night people. You know, I'm talking about people that you know have transferred and imparted something into you from being connected to them and to their life and to, you know, things you read from us in our sermons and our messages. And if you keep hearing them, there's a something that we're giving you. We're giving you. It's a field. And so it says, I went by the field of a sloth or lazy person, by the vineyard. So there's a part of the field that's supposed to be turned into a vineyard of a man. Notice what it says. What? Void of understanding. Don't, meaning he doesn't even know how to relate to the part of his field that will get him wealthy. You see, because the vineyard was the part of your field that got you very wealthy back then because they grew grapes in their vineyard. They grew grapes that they turned into raisins or they turned it into wine. Are you hearing me in the Holy Ghost? Man, they grew you- grapes and or they grew wine from the vineyard. If the wine didn't turn out right from the grapes, then you turn those grapes into raisins and they would make these special raisin cakes that were very valuable. Kings would eat these. Oh, kings. But their leader, their father, their mother, their family, their leaders gave them a field and spoke this thing into them and they taught them how to operate in them. They taught them how to do Bible studies, how to teach people and baptize people. They gave them a field. They left them an inheritance. He said, but by the vineyard of the man void of understanding, he had not only a field, but also a vineyard and didn't know what to do with it. Verse 31. And lo, it was all what? Grown over with thorns. That means he just neglected it and didn't focus in and zero in right there on that thing. He couldn't see the invisible things in the spirit of which that vineyard had the potential and the capabilities of doing. I'm saying this to you tonight, church, because it has to be about intentional living intentional every step every day like the apostle paul said i'm I'm walking with purpose in every step i'm intentional i'm not playing games with these people around here in this life trying to figure out you know who like me who don't like me oh i don't know i have a field and i'm not going to be lazy with it i have a vineyard and i'm going to understand what i'm supposed to do with this vineyard because this vineyard that i was left with by these people in my life that have spoken to me is giving me something very powerful and, and, and I can prosper. Remember, prosper means in spiritual, physical, financial, mental. I'm supposed to prosper. I'm supposed to relate to my vineyard. I'm supposed to know how to understand my vineyard. The Bible says this world is our vineyard. Does it not? Yes. Look at verse 31. And lo, it was all grown over. There's some stuff that's growing over. These storms. It's choking out. These nettles choking out the things that's supposed to be growing from it. Watch this. It had covered the face of the vineyard. This most valuable vineyard. We can't let it get covered up with some sadness and, and insecurities and all. I can't let this stuff cover it up thereof. And watch this. This is powerful. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. Stop. Go back to the stone wall because I want you to see this. When he saw the stone wall was broken down, he said, ah, now I see and I considered it well. You see what he was teaching right there? They only put stone walls around the most valuable thing that they got in their field. And that was the vineyard. He said, not only was the ground overgrown with thorns, not only was the face of it covered with nettles, he was like, but the stones that they would put up these stone walls to keep people from coming in there stealing your wine or stealing your 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 grapes or stealing those things that could make sugar and that could make cakes. And, and that was a very valuable thing back then. But he said, he looked and he saw that he wasn't even trying to protect it. 
It was like, who is this individual? Verse 32. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and I received instruction. And that's when he really understand. If we don't deal with this field, if we don't understand how to relate to our field, if we don't go back and nurture the value of this vineyard that the Lord has given us inside through the Holy Ghost, we're going to be void of understanding. And we're not going to know that it's all covered up with thorns and needles. And it's, we're going to let this thing that's so valuable break down. Listen, church, I'm on a mission. And if, if I'm on a mission, you got to be on a mission with me. Hallelujah. That's the only reason why God got us connected together is because we're on a mission. We're on a mission together to, to, to be the best Holy Ghost field individual we could be to connect and do all that greater works is asking us to do in this life. Praise the Lord. If not, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little still waiting, don't know what to do, and a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall poverty come as one that travaileth and that wants as an armed bandit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. We love you. We open up our heart and our spirit to you, God, to understand the scripture and this word, God. You said it. You said it over and over and over and over. You said that in you we live and that in you we live, move and that you we have our existence. God, you're going to help us to understand how to relate to our vineyard, how to relate to our field. God, you're going to help us to understand how not to fold our hands in any kind of way. There's too much you got inside of us, and there's too much that has to be done in this life and in this world. God, you have made it so that someday we will be able to judge angels, the Bible says, and nations. But in the meantime, Lord, we want to know how to deal with this vineyard how to deal with this field, how to deal with getting these walls back, how to secure these things, God, these valuable things that we got that you have put on us and that you are teaching us how to manage, God. We're asking this tonight, though. Let it come out. Let it be in our sleep. Let it talk to us in our sleep. Let it be revealed to us in our sleep, Lord. Let us open our mind and understanding, even when we're not paying attention. Let our spirit, man, quicken us and tell us this is it. That's it. Go for it. Stay on the edge of your seat. Be looking for what God is saying do and do now because we're not going to be folding our hands with a little sleep and a little slumber in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah, church.